Hello and welcome everyone. We are back here again uh, to talk to Sandeep Balakrishna on the mega series that we started a couple of episodes back on the destruction of Indian history by the Marxists. Uh, Sandeep has been revealing with his scholarly research in each episode some stunning facts, some disturbing facts. Um, and uh, we saw in some of the comments that the first five education ministers of India post-independence were from a particular community and how that also had a part to play in the uh, twisting of history that we all were subjugated to through academia. Sandeep brought us to a stage in the last episode where we spoke about how the Marxists had begun to capture all the key academic institutions. So in this episode, uh, taking on from there, uh, the endeavor will be to talk to Sandeep on how did Marxists exactly go about capturing these institutes of eminence and thereby controlling the narrative for generations after that. The techniques that they used, and we'll take it to a stage where uh, we'll uh, pick on Sandeep's knowledge to talk about uh, some of the historians as we now know, uh, thanks to people like Sandeep, and the kind of damage they had begun to cause. And we'll get into the details of the damage they caused in the next episode. So uh, uh, here we are uh, for this fascinating uh, revelation on the twisting of Indian history. And before we talk to Sandeep uh, on this uh, Pious occasion of Ram Nami after the Pran Pratishtha. Uh, uh, wishing you all a very happy Ram Nami. So let's start with Sandeep. Hi Sandeep. So good to be back with you as always. So Sandeep, you spoke about some of the institutes that uh, the Marxists have begun to capture when we uh, concluded the last episode. And one institute particularly that I think is lesser known than the ICHR uh, was the institute you referred to was the NIEPA. So, uh, could you uh, take us from there on to each of these institutes, uh, their role, uh, at least on paper, and how did the Marxists go about infiltrating each of these institutes? All right. <clears throat> Welcome back once again, uh, Parag. Thanks. Uh, now, when you say the history establishment as a generic term, without going into specific uh, names of uh, specific uh, institutions, when you say history establishment, there is a fundamental, uh, uh, you know, definitive or rather definitional aspect to it. When something becomes an establishment, it automatically has a connotation of a ruling class. All right. Now, as it evolved in India after um, independence, and since these uh, Marxists, these fellows uh, began to slowly infiltrate the institutions, history also became a ruling class. Rather, history establishment was part of the ruling class. In the, I, you make a very, very good point. Yeah. Okay. In the last or the last two, last episode, I mentioned how, uh, you know, in the pre-independence period, although history writing was in a sense, directly controlled by the colonial British, there was uh, enough freedom, enough academic freedom to conduct objective research. Now, what the findings, interpretations of those research, how they were interpreted, say, by British and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, colonial scholars, chiefly German colonial scholars, uh, that is a different subject. And uh, how Indian scholars who worked on the same findings would at many times, in a majority of cases, would come to the exact opposite conclusion. So this was a state of what is known as history establishment in the colonial era. Now, after independence, the government sh ideally should have had no business to be in the <coughs> writing of history or history textbooks. So it should have at best created an autonomous body which would meet from time to time, you know, discuss within the scholarly community and come to a sense, uh, consensus as to what the uh, truths of history, what how it should be interpreted, uh, what should be the acceptable conclusions and so on. Because it is, history is like a, uh, like I said, you know, it's a quest of truth. So, and with the emergence of new evidence, with the emergence of, say, new findings, the consensus which had been accepted so far might have to be discarded completely or it might have to be modified. So it is a continuous process. But the kind of 
hold that the government itself, you know, by directly getting into the business of history writing, it became completely politicized almost from day one. That is almost from the time that Nawab Nehru, you know, uh, became the lord and the supreme master of everything in India, including history. So he, that man had an opinion on everything as we have seen. <laughs> history is no different. Now, when we come say to the mid 60s or the late 60s, that is when the rot really began to seep in. 1969, like I said, was a pivotal point in uh, the history of uh, post-independent India. That was when Indira Gandhi split the Congress party and packed, uh, you know, you know, formed her government, packing them with uh, communist support. Then the JNU was formed. The trade-off that was done, you mentioned. Yeah, trade-off. And then the JNU was formed, ICHR was formed. At that time, Nurul Hassan, her education minister, he hunted, you know, collected all the hardcore Marxist uh, uh, alleged academics and put them into JNU and ICHR. ICHR was formed in 1972 and that soon became the hub of Marxist intrigue. This is not Marxist history writing, it is, Mar it is a hub of Marxist intrigue. All right. You call it intrigue? Uh, intrigue. Okay. Intrigue. Not so a cabal. Plot. Okay. Plot, okay. Mm. Oh, that's where the plots were hatched. Plot, okay. Plot, okay. Intrigue, cabal, Got it. plot, Got clique, it. group, all, cabal. Uh, okay. All of them apply. <laughs> all of them apply. And uh, now with the formation of ICHR, with the form of uh, establishment of JNU, and then you already, by, the, by that time, you already had these uh, uh, powerful uh, alleged schools of history called Aligarh University and Allahabad University. Allahabad, so you see how systematically these fellows have penetrated the whole uh, field of history writing. Now, with the, the formation of the Indian Council for Historical Research, along with the founding of Jawaharlal Nehru University was a watershed event. Now, there was history writing before that and there was history writing that began after these two institutes, institutions were formed. Now, to cut a long story uh, short, in uh, 1965 or 67, Romila Thapar wrote a pamphlet for a history journal or something in which she, for the first time, she used the term communalizing history writing. So she, she used she it. She used it for the first uh, time. What so, uh, it was an open call. It was basically, I mean, it was a pamphlet, yes, but it was also an ideological statement. <coughs> it was a call for action, call to action. That whatever went by in the name of history before we came in should all be discarded. Or she didn't, I mean, yeah, in so many words, she pretty much hinted at discarding all, all the history writing that had, uh, you know, come until then. By the likes of Jadunath Sarkar. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that whole uh, okay. stalwarts of Indian Renaissance. Mm. Uh, and then she said, we have to have a relook at Indian history, all aspects of Indian history. So that, you know, according to her, and of course, she was aided by her Marxist uh, gang uh, members, and uh, a new formula was hatched, which reinterpreted, India, not, not reinterpreted, which viewed Indian history using... Marxist theory of, you know, haves versus have-nots, oppressor versus oppressed, capitalist versus uh, communists, uh, what is that? Communalists versus progressives. So, these new terms began to be, uh, uh, you know, they were introduced after she wrote that pamphlet. I mean, I'm simplifying a lot of uh, uh, details here, but Pretty much, this is the essence. So, this was the beginning of a reset 000 to, yes, to yes, paint, start yes, painting their yes, own version. Yes. Okay. So, that was also a declaration of war. Okay. You see how systematically they work. 1930s, May Muhammad Habib came in. Then that uh, other fellow, uh, Satish Chandra came in. One of those fellows, Satish Chandra or Bipan Chandra, the older of the two. So, he sat and began to do this Marxist uh, tampering in Allahabad University. And in Aligarh, Muhammad Habib was ruling the roost. Uh, so you see how they had set the pitch 
how they had queered the pitch. So like a multi-pronged Yes, attack. multi-pronged attack. So when the institutional capture was complete, by the time of uh, by the time Indira Gandhi became the uh, Prime Minister and uh, Nurul Hassan became the Education Minister, the occupation was near total. Occupation, interesting word. Occupation, usurpation. That is the uh, it was uh, nearly complete, and one of the uh, techniques that they adopted was uh, okay. I list out three or four techniques. One is to pack all the levers of power in all these institutions with fellow travelers, comrades. You know, they uh, these fellows are very good at giving self uh, self certifications. They continue. They to call all themselves as uh, in in those days they used to call themselves as uh, progressives. They used to call themselves as you know comrades and future looking uh, something uh, heralds and things like that. I mean, it's funny even they 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 use these technical terms even in a casual conversation. You mentioned yeah this is how they talk yeah, even this uh, how they talk even even you can't have a regular conversation with these fellows. <laughs> nothing regular about yeah. So how was the weather? You know how are your kids? No nothing. It's only about revolution and comradeship and you know how comrade Mao has established paradise and in China. And imaginary battle they're fighting yeah, every day. Like that, yeah, yeah. So this is how it went, and packing these fellows, their ideological uh, uh, friends, at the highest levers of power, and then forming a mutual admiration society. That was step number one. Step number two, and here is where you have to give it to these leftist fellows. The kind of understanding of the bureaucracy that the leftists have is unparalleled anywhere. They know exactly which switch to, uh, you know, turn on, and which uh, room will be illuminated as a result of that, or which switch to turn off so that a bomb is detonated in the fourth floor. So they, this this is innate, uh, innate within. Uh, yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Because see, when you look at how communist parties were organized and still are organized, they think themselves as governments. Okay. So ah, there is a Politburo oh, and all of that. Politburo, yeah, yeah. then there is secretariat. The construct the, itself is that ah, of the government. The construct itself is that. So they are mimicking a government. Got it, got it. In, in, in countries which are uh, uh, not yet fully communist. So this was how they operated. So yeah. this, very in- okay, yeah, I get the insight. Yeah. The, the, their understanding of the workings of bureaucracy is extraordinary. So, that is uh, uh, technique number two. And technique number three is the destruction or the marginalization of their ideological enemies. You know, there is no thing that you can disagree with a Marxist. You are either their comrades or you are their enemy. Enemy. You're with us there or against us? There is no golden mean. There is no, you know, middle path at all. So, all the honest scholars, non-ideological scholars, they don't have to be, you know, Hindu scholars of history and things like that. No, objective, honest uh, honest scholars who, you know, for the love of knowledge and uh, for the sake of scholarship, disinterested scholarship, they were viewed as enemies. And so, as long as they had a tenure, they ensured that, you know, either they were co-opted or their work was marginalized. And... Once this capture was uh, uh, accomplished, these fellows began to uh, write new textbooks based on this Marxist framework, uh, which I'll come to, you know, what their Marxist frame, alleged framework of history is. I'll come to that later. But now for the technique. They began to produce new history textbooks at all levels, from the primary level till uh, postdoctoral level. And a new breed, a new crop of new harvest of this kind of Marxist uh, history, rather Marxist ideology packaged as history, as Indian history, that began to flood our universities, that began to flood into our popular narratives of history and so on. And uh, then they also took over all the university journals. So they took over that too? Yes, yes, completely. And... uh, Disagreement, dissent was not tolerated, and if it, you know, it if it went on beyond a certain threshold, it was ruthlessly crushed. Careers were destroyed, and uh, just to give you a, uh, you know, 
random uh, fact this man <coughs> irfan habib he has written a wonderful book uh, on uh, uh, mughal revenue administration it's a good book okay good book in the sense it is data rich okay you i mean you can't some of the things that he writes in uh, uh, in the mughal revenue system is uh, unacceptable but you have to give it to him for his research and the data data okay primary sources the bibliography and all these things are very good now he writes an entire volume or two volumes on mughal revenue administration without even referring once to the work of sir jadunath sarkar so that's how the ha uh, erasure started erasure happening. started happening and how would these how would the students studying under uh, you know say irfan habib or romila thapar you set up an incentive system where incentive system for students whereby if you quote and cite only these fellows then you get awarded your degree or phd or ma or whatever so th so one, this was one, let, let me uh, uh. let me give you a real life example one phd scholar submitted a thesis about uh, some 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 area of uh, the mogal period and that uh, thesis uh, uh, the guide it was submitted to a marxist historian at jnu so he went through the thesis and he found that in one uh, footnote the student had cited jadunath sarkar only once <laughs> And only that, once it was rejected that was good enough to so you see the incentive doesn't uh, dis uh, incentive how the system this system was this is so clever yes and if that is at that higher level at the lower levels in the primary school textbooks you distort history so much and you are from day one you are fed this kind of distorted history so what happens the student at class level at primary and then middle school high school college pu level grows up reading this distorted history and thinks that this is real indian history so thereby you create one entire generation of students who then graduate and become teachers and once you retire they take your place mm -hmm. and then this vicious cycle goes on so that is technique number 3 technique number 4 once all these people who graduate students who graduate in the humanities not necessarily history but overall speaking overall humanities these people nurture them they give them a career path matlab tum life ke liye set ho they create they have created that kind of a uh, you know lifelong career track so you are part of the tribe you are part of the tribe you accepted the agenda agenda in in many cases the agenda is already set by set by them and indoctrinated to you through in school textbooks correct correct so you don't know an alternative at all no alternative is provided and that line you uh, said keeps haunting me they got our children so any yeah, indoctrination has happened children. so that and they would pack them off to they would you know give them lecturer ships and others would go on to do upsc classic example the entire humanities especially history uh, uh, books material that you have to read for an upsc aspirant is all written by these fellows and and, and the scary part is these go on and were to yeah, become they, very responsible people yeah, in they, the they, they, they go on to become civil servants i bureaucrats ias officers they decide the policies how policy should be implemented so this is nothing short of a total subversion of the indian state itself Absolutely. Using education as a uh, vehicle. Vehicle. They have done this at on a spectacular scale, sir. Yes, absolutely. All right. So that is technique number four. And parallel, look at the areas they have captured. Intellectuals. They encourage them to you know become intellectuals, whatever the term means. You know, I I really don't like that word, <laughs> intellectual. Uh, I mean, I associate the term intellectual with sloth. Ah, okay, and that is why uh, there is a very uh, erudite, very learned uh, British author. His name is Paul Johnson. Paul Johnson. Paul Johnson. He has written a fantastic book called uh, Intellectuals. Intellectuals ah. from Marx to uh, mm, I don't know from Marx to somebody. 
not sam petroda i'm just kidding no 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 please yeah i'm <laughs> sorry <laughs> from marx to somebody uh, till his time so he profiles about uh, 14 uh, so called intellectuals and literateurs beginning with uh, uh, rousseau all the way up to ernest hemingway and other okay. people so uh, cultural vandals like uh, jean paul sartre sartre they are mentioned and um, who's that other fellow norman mailer all these people are profiled it's a fantastic book so he says uh, he has very acerbic things to say about this uh, so called intellectuals that the work that was being performed by the clergy i mean it's set in the context of uh, uh, the western culture but it has uh, uh, universal validity in the sense that the work that used to be performed by the christian clergy remember the clergy is a very learned uh, class of people i mean they might use it to convert uh, non christians but that's a separate matter you cannot question their erudition okay. they go through a very very rigorous kind Process of training of training getting so there 12 years 14 years 20 years it's not it's not an easy uh, profession in that sense okay so the work that used to be done by these people to educate the society to refine the society to maintain a sense of stability and order and balance in the society was usurped by these intellectuals without the aid of tradition hmm this is why tradition is important but i'm digressing horribly anyway so the marxists and remember that karl marx had a great respect for rousseau not too many people know this okay a lot of the ideas that marx uh, uh, you know has written and spoken about uh, can be traced back to rousseau so borrowed from rousseau borrowed inspired whatever okay okay so he had a great respect for that man mm-hmm. so that fellow and marxists when when for the longest time when you use the word intellectual it was associated with either a socialist or a marxist a lot of people mm. have forgotten this point to be an intellectual is to be a marxist and vice versa synonyms synonyms so these fellows in our country as elsewhere because these fellows are photocopies or slaves of russia or china or france or wherever and they encourage their students to become intellectuals they encourage them to become academics they encourage them to become journalists it is not a coincidence that even today majority of people in journalism be it editors reporters whoever columnists they are all marxists even today this process started way back in the 1950s and then when the marxists took over you know they took it to a different level so my college memory correct me sandeep uh, uh, the only piece of source of news was a print medium and mm-hmm. the times of india mumbai mm. where i studied mm. and it still is among the thickest times of india as compared to say the bangalore one for yes, instance yes, yes. and dilip padgaonkar was the editor mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. when i um, mm-hmm. apply what you said to what i read then mm-hmm. it it fits the bill perfectly mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah a marxist yeah. the editors used to address each other some of the top editors used to address each other as dear comrade in meetings and seminars and it is a badge of honor it is a badge of honor yeah, they, they they had a big uh, air about them so that is how they captured so you see what happens once you capture education you capture the whole nation nation more most importantly what this kind of capture does is that it has a great potential to influence what is known as popular culture uh popular fashions it see what they say what they have professed and what they have written about and spoken about speeches articles all these things they become the topics for day to day gossip and conversation so they they're, they're driving conversations they're right driving around conversations the last night in coffee shops in you know tea shops chai ka dukan this kind of thing and people why why does it become uh, you know part of the why did marxism become part of the popular lingo because they had control over all these establishments 
plus even today when you newspaper reading is a subconscious habit so you in don't the really think yes, about it yes. and there is a tendency even today to believe in the printed world yes absolutely a All big right. fallacy here uh, so the the average person proverbial common man he or she doesn't think twice they don't indulge in you know give critical scrutiny to what is written in newspapers and magazines and so parag is reading india today sandeep is reading outlook somebody else is a uh, 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 you know reading some other paper the same opinion is reflected in all these three yes. magazines the shades are different yeah we've all been recipients of that that's so, all so so every medium which touches the proverbial common man was in their control their control so this is how they they rig the whole system so when it when it when you capture popular imagination who will scrutinize what history you have written sir these are all some of the techniques and i'll uh, close off this technique section with one uh, uh, last uh, point how many of us including me know how the system to procure books for government libraries uh, function nobody knows no marxism they knew this you might think that uh, uh, you know government libraries uska kya hai i mean who visits they are all free libraries no anybody can walk in and you know read essentially you can't borrow it but but why do you need to capture libraries because libraries are funded as we all know by taxpayer money and a big share of taxpayer money goes into the history establishment to you know the library department it's all distributed so by capturing libraries over a period of time marx is ensured that only books which uh, are supportive or which endorse uh, uh, their ideology only such books should be available to the common person so every um every touch point yes they visualize the whole map yeah yeah and systematically this is why i said their 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 understanding their cultivation of the bureaucracy uh, of the functioning of bureaucracy is unparalleled so you fill all the public libraries only with marxist uh, uh, literature so an ordinary people person who comes to visits the library with a open mind a blank you know clean slate he or she finds only this trash with no alternate and therefore it is taken as gospel correct so example instead of having the original veda vyasa's uh, mahabharata you have a marxist interpretation of mahabharata <laughs> this is how they rig the whole system and on uh, uh, i forgot to mention one point when i was talking about newspapers journalism they went to such extents you know parag they would have a marxist monitoring in charge of a section called letters to the editor okay so to see what the public opinion is or reactions are correct so this we saw uh, most notably you take the newspaper cuttings from the last uh, 50 years at least 50 if not 60 years at least look at the letters of editor letters to the editor uniform opinion not one uh, uh, dissenting opinion about say communalism what they define as communalism and about uh, not one letter critical of nehru's secularism will be published very ah, rare okay okay so even out the, of a thousand letters uh, endorsing uh, communism and socialism and glorifying uh, nawab nehru and uh, singing praises to uh, stalin and the soviet model and the great uh, par- communist paradise that jyoti basu ushered in west bengal out of a thousand letters uh, endorsing these things only five letters mildly critical of them would be published oh, there was a brilliant there was a police man in the guise of a masquerading as a journalist sitting and monitoring the letters to the editor my god so so e- even if there was a little chance of public opinion being creeping into these uh, mm-hmm. newspapers mm-hmm. Uh, showing dissent or a different opinion mm. even that was filtered yes, out yes. so so a reader mm. who may want to consider an alternate opinion will find it everybody thinks the same way too exactly 
so well thought out yeah. so well thought out the, look at the scale extent and the uh, you know at the levels of which they have uh, you know manipulated the whole system so this is the techniques and uh, now we come to the uh, capture of the ichr and on that uh, you know uh, just on the ichr the classic work exposing their misdeeds is arun shauri's uh, uh, you know masterpiece and i have it with me here today yeah i think it is you need to show yes yeah. their technology their line and their fraud this this book is worth its weight in gold and uh, while shauri mainly focuses uh, on the misdeeds of the marxists in ichr indian council for historical research while that is a focus uh he covers a very broad uh, uh, field uh, and talks about uh, you know like the subtitle says their technology their line and their fraud technology is basically techniques what you just covered yeah and uh, their line line meaning the marxist line or the communist uh, theory and practice and their fraud is the kind of crimes actual crimes punishable by the indian penal code that these fellows have committed for uh, what 45 years and crimes is the way to call it yeah it is a crime and here he gives a list of all the top and most prominent uh, uh, scholars alleged scholars of uh, indian history who were completely marxists and you know i i've said this before i think and i don't mind repeating it there is no such thing as a marxist historian yes you mentioned this you can't be a historian and a marxist at the same time all right now some of the prominent names that uh, shauri lists in this book r s sharma ram sharan sharma suraj bhan some of them are dead d n jha romila thapar athar ali irfan habib shireen moosvi b n pande uh, r l shukla sushil shrivastava k m shrimali Suvera Jayaswal, Satish Chandra, Bipin Chandra, Sumit Sarkar, Janendra Pandey. So these are some of the partial names. I took these specific names because these are precisely the alleged history scholars who were summoned by the by both the High Court and the Supreme Court to no no Allahabad High Court to give evidence and testimony the in the Ram Janma Bhumi oh. case. the tentacles the tentacles are all over okay all right so i'll tell you how that happened now when the whole uh, uh, after rajiv gandhi opened the uh, locks of um, the former disputed yeah. structure you know the courts intervened and you know he called the courts didn't inter- intervene as yet he called for both parties the hindu parties and the muslim parties to come on the table negotiation table and you know show evidence and after that rajiv gandhi lost his uh, uh, government and then he died and then chandrashekar government it continued the same process at that time and uh, you know on this side the marxists had spread the lie that the disputed structure which was called a mosque was not built on the site of an existing temple which was demolished they try to build it even now yeah even now after the verdict uh, all right based on zero evidence whereas until then globally the historical uh, consensus in the uh, historical scholarly community was that yes it was built after the de- demolishing a thing overnight these fellows denied it if they had not denied it things would have been a lot dif- different history would have been completely different but they denied it based on fabricated non existent false evidence and they committed forgeries 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 to such an extent that they forged entire uh, books of uh, history which were non existent in urdu and farsi and said that accord this was a book that existed and which says that yes so it is like creating a backdated uh, yeah okay the lens they have gone and they hunted down they ransacked all the libraries and institutions throughout india which contained historical evidence which contained the mention that a hindu temple was demolished by babar general mir baki and on that spot a mosque was raised 
So they went around. They went around destroying every destroying trace of such evidence. Yes, every evidence, every trace. And why did they do this? Because they had convinced this pro masjid committee, Babri Masjid Action Committee. They were their clients. And the names that I read out were, you know, uh, the people who had taken them, uh, the Babri Masjid Ac Action Committee. Uh, you know, these were their, uh, these histori alleged historians were their advocates. You know, I think you mentioned this, it's, uh, while it is a, you know, simple and obvious point, it still needs to be made. Mm. All the names you read out are Hindus. Yeah. Barring, you know. Barring uh, Irfan Habib yeah, and a yeah. couple of others, yeah. I mean, uh, the deracination that... I'll come to that. Yeah. I will come to that. So, in a way, I mean, deracination, good point. So, we'll address it right away. So, not just deracination. These are the very people who wrote our history textbooks. Rajay. See, Romila Thapar is now about 82 or 83 years old. So, she still would have been in her relative youth when this Babri Masjid thing was happening. And when she wrote that infamous pamphlet about communalizing Indian history, history, she would have been in the prime of her youth. These are the people directly responsible for the demolition of that former disputed structure. So, uh, the crimes word that uh, Shauri uh, mm. rightly calls them and you also mentioned. Mm. I think, uh, uh, okay, I'm... Uh, uh, it's an ardent wish now, uh, mm. provoked by what he said, mm. is that eventually there has to be some penalty for these crimes that they committed. So, that is the beauty, Parag. The amount of crimes, the multi-pronged crimes have committed, financial, cultural, they are cultural vandals of the highest order or the lowest order. Cultural vandalism, the poisoning and indoctrination and the destruction of the psyche of three generations plus their financial crimes, the kind of five-star lives that they led, fattening themselves on taxpayer money. All this. They completely got away with it. Unscathed, untouched, unpunished. I've been just hoping against hope Sir, some e retrospective... E even today, all those, uh, you know, mainstream narratives... Uh, you know, scroll, wire, all these things. They call, they address Romila Thapar as a doyen of Indian history. Yeah. I, I mean, there are some mainstream publications in Hindu no, forget, too. Forget being punished. They still enjoy this kind of status in some circles. So, coming back to their institutional, some other techniques, you know, other things, details of the institutional damage that they have done. Uh, let me see. I'll tell you two or three stories out here. Yeah, please. I think uh, the those who are watching and listening would really appreciate it. Yeah. So, in no particular order, after, you know, the capture of uh, ICHR, and this is related to ICHR. I mean, that's the best illustration of how their uh, 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 fraudulent system, um, rigged system works. What happens is these are top positions, right, ICHR, they are all directly funded by the HRD ministry or education ministry. Now, uh, you have different bureaucratic positions, there is a chairman, there is a director, there is a director for a department, then there is a department head, there is a medieval unit, then there is an ancient Indian unit, these are all prized positions. So, what they would do is, they would do a, they had set up a very neat and tidy uh, system of musical chairs whereby the same people would keep getting the same positions repeatedly. So, this is what Arun Shauri uh, writes and here are some numbers. Uh, how is it that over 25 years, persons from their school alone have been nominated to the ICHR? How come that Romila Thapar had been on the council four times? Four times. Irfan Habib, five times. Satish Chandra, four times. S. Gopal, Three times. S. Gopal is the son of S. Radha Krishnan. Okay. The same pattern held for the post of the chairman. So we all meet, you know, close comrades, right? It's fiefdom. It is a fiefdom. Total, right? fiefdom, total nepotism. Aap Bollywood ka kya nepotism Correct, baat yeah. kar rahe ho? Look at this. And that, that itself, it doesn't end there. They would, you know, come up with uh, newer methodology to mooch off money from the taxpayer. 
okay you know concoct a project which will never be completed by the way okay give it a budget and then distribute the largest among your clique so this is uh, how it is uh, let me read this out there was some translation project okay of great works of indian history that is that was called a translation project it began in april 1972 okay and uh, initially it was decided that you know a lot of good works eminent works of indian history were selected out of which were the 11 volumes majestic volumes of history and culture of indian people by bharati vidyabhavan all right so that was selected for translating a translation into all indian languages lo and behold suddenly that those volumes were discarded and what happens next a committee a committee decides these things guess who all sat on that committee s gopal <laughs> tapan roy choudhary satish chandra romila thapar and what happened to this uh, committee was that after the uh, vidya uh, bharati vidya bhavan volumes were uh, discarded they said look we have to have a non communal yeah you mentioned about this that authentic sources yes. read these volumes yeah. so, so no, uh, non communal books should be translated so lo and behold the largest number of titles which the eminent historians selected were of the eminences themselves i, I was reading there is going to go to that it actually is true okay <laughs> and of those who advocated their politics so who is part of this new committee the same ram sharan sharma the same ram sharan sharma was a chairman of ichr for five times and he was awarded five titles for this translation project s gopal got three titles romila thapar got three titles irfan habib got two titles his dad mohammad habib he got two titles satish chandra got one title and you know what is the icing on this cake the disgusting icing on this cake is the works of the communist leader and former kerala chief minister ems nambur nambudari pad his work malayalam works were selected for translation by a body ostensibly dedicated to the furtherance and progress of indian history <laughs> So this borders on incest. I mean, sorry to use the word, but <laughs> it is it is intellectual incest. And guess which all uh, works uh, were dropped apart from Bharati Vidya Bhavan's uh, history volumes? Not a single volume of Sir Jadunath Sarkar. Nothing of Doctor R C Majumdar. Nothing of a man, a leader, a doyen of the stature of none other than Lokman Tilak. and again you know the point is that uh, i i had to go back to your term now nehru <laughs> i mean this is uh, I, i think a series of crimes that he also needs to be tried for yeah totally now what was the cost of this project at that time remember 1972 cost of this project 41 lakhs 89000 but the biggest uh, tax payer money drainer of all is a project called towards freedom towards freedom to towards freedom okay now this was a very ambitious project of course ambitious to document every single history every single detail of the indian freedom struggle okay so they said it would go on for about uh, uh, what towards freedom about uh, 20 volumes if i am not mistaken i am not getting the number out here okay but yeah substantial volumes it basically create a perpetual revenue stream mm -hmm. cash cow <laughs> correct and this project it was started again in 1972 guess when it was disbanded 2000 early 2000 2015 first year oh one year after the modi government came to power <laughs> and guess how much it had gobbled up by then 43 crores it's shocking shocking the same irfan habib was also part of that uh, member of the icchr who uh, gave that proposal 
among uh, in that committee basically when he was asked to be made accountable in 2015 for his contribution to this towards freedom project you know what he said i hereby recuse myself from the project it seems yeah after after gobbling up substantial sums of money he recuses himself he recuses himself very convenient na I mean, I, they literally had a field day. I mean, they could do whatever they wanted, right? They did and they got away with uh, that. And then, uh, yeah, 19 volumes. Yeah, New York Towards Lord Freedom, 19 volumes. So, here are some data points that I'll give. Uh, I'll read, uh, read it out directly from Shauri's book. The volumes were assigned to different scholars. Our eminences, as usual, let the rest. Rupees 12,000 were doled out for each volume. Remember the time. Yeah. 72 by 12,000 was big money. Significant money, money yeah. Okay. The result here in the words of the ICHR is the list of the period to be covered by the volume, the scholar to whom it was assigned, the money the scholar collected and the result. Shauri gives 19, uh, I mean for the 19 volumes and the money. Before 1957, that is the title of the volume. A scholar named K. Rajayan gets 12,000 bucks. The manuscript was allegedly submitted but not traceable. Very convenient. <laughs> not traceable. Volume 2, 1857 to 1885. S.R. Mehrotra is a scholar. He gets 12 grand. All of them get 12 grand, like I said. Status, not submitted. 1885 to 1886, Volume 3. Scholar is Bipan Chandra, not submitted. 1896 to 1898, Volume 4, not assigned. Not assigned. Okay. 1899 to 1902, B.R. Grover submitted and published. 1902 to 1903, not assigned. 1903 to 1905, not assigned. 1905 to 1907, scholar is Sumit Sarkar, not submitted, money swallowed. 1907 to 9, Sumit Sarkar again, another stash of 12 grand, not submitted. 19, 1910 to 1915, M.N. Das, money swallowed, not submitted. 1915 to 1919, T.K. Ravindran, uh, 12,000 bucks gone down the drain, manuscript not submitted. 1919 to 1920, V.N. Datta, submitted and published. 1920 to 1922, Sita Ram Singh, submitted under production. 1922 to 24, Shri Kumar and Nair, 12,000 bucks gone. Submitted and published. 1924 to 26, Amba Prasad, not submitted. 27 to 29, Bimal Prasad, 12 grand, gone, not submitted. 1930 to 31, Bimal Prasad again, 12,000 bucks gone again, not submitted. 1932 to 34, Bipan Chandra, again 12,000, not submitted. 1934 to 37, Gopala Krishna, 12,000 bucks gone not submitted and people who have not submitted earlier have been called again have been given money not to submit again not submitting so you have to get into this level of detail to understand the precise kind of damage that these buggers have done you know a commission of inquiry needs to be set up all that has all been done sir and uh, no, look these are the people who have created this system no, no what i meant is uh, post 2014 no, the one some kind of an inquiry committee was uh, uh, started during um, Vajpayee's first term. Oh, it was NDA's first okay. term, but nothing happened. Okay. Those fellows got back into power again. But anyway, okay. then they had their my bap protector in uh -huh. the form of Arjun Singh. But anyway, so uh, one more project uh, like this, something called the uh, Economic Data and Statistics Report. Okay six volumes so this was touted as another prestigious uh, uh, project look at the kind of money that gobbled up what 12,000 into six that is 96,000 no, no not a single volume no output no output one more project uh, was a project on the documentation of India's economic history so what is the status of that it was commenced in 1992 and 17 volumes in total were to be produced between 1992 and 1997. 
the total budget was 25 lakhs and as of today that is shauri published this book in 1991 if i am not no not 91 98 so as of 1998 not a single volume out of these 17 volumes have been produced the status remains unchanged and uh, a cool 19 and a half lakhs have already been waha cobbled up then there is one more project it's called medieval sources project so what is the status of this and you know uh, this medieval uh, sources uh, project and the volumes that were supposed to be produced uh, under this mr satish chandra and his disciples his fan uh, his, his his close club they were assigned one volume it was a hindi translation of something called the early sources of akbar's reign not completed money spent money spent Satish Chandra seems to be a fairly pivotal figure in all. I have this. read out these lists. Uh, remember the list I read out. Yes, yes, yes. Ayodhya yes, thing. Yes, yes. They, all these fellows form the part. Satish Chandra also was a key part of the Indira Gandhi. Uh, he was, yes, he was. Yeah, same fellow, right? Yeah, yeah. Same fellow. So these are all the original eminent historians. Mm -hmm. Rest are all, you know, street gundas. Street gundas. Uh, Utna ye pick pockets hai. <laughs> these are the asli dons. Don. Uh, doing this operation, conceiving uh, the operation, and running it. so one volume was assigned to satish chandra and his uh, friends it was a hindi translation of early sources of akbar's reign not completed money gone irfan habib was assigned akhbarat e aurangzeb 27 grand he took for that not completed another historian munis raza it was the atlas of the mughal empire he got 22400 rupees not completed Nothing. another historian <clears throat> anis faruqi he was supposed to work on something called the tashir ul aqwani he pocketed 9 grand not completed satish chandra again another yeah, surprise his name keeps dropping up documents on social and economic history for this he took 23 grand not completed paramatma sharan okay this is a surprising name so this will form part of what i am about to say paramatma sharan was an acknowledged scholar of uh, uh, muslim period of indian history he was a fantastic first rate scholar in uh, farsi language as well so he was assigned a volume called the tarikh e akbari okay and he received 18500 rupees for that he submitted the manuscript but the manuscript was not traceable we'll take a break okay so dr parmatma sharan like i said he was a distinguished uh, scholar of uh, the muslim period of indian history and a first rate uh, scholar of uh, persian as well he had submitted this uh, manuscript uh, uh, you know titled uh, uh tarikh e akbari which is basically a documentation of akbar's uh, uh, biography in a sense and he had submitted the manuscript to the ichr and uh, in 1995 paramatma sharan's son in law sent a letter of inquiry to the ichr okay he said that by that time uh, dr sharan had passed away hmm. so his son in law sends a letter of inquiry to uh, ichr he says that look my late father in law he had submitted a manuscript uh, uh, of the tarikh e akbari to your institution but uh, i got a reply saying that uh, you know we couldn't find a copy of the manuscript in our uh, in his house and he the status says that the manuscript is submitted so please look into it we are not, we are unable to find it we need the manuscript so the ichr basically so you know assured him that we look into the matter and then they conducted some kind of inquiry and said that yes manuscript is uh, submitted but not traceable okay that was the reply uh, his son in law sharan's son in law gets okay then the whole story 
begins, you know, how the bureaucracy at ICHR works. Let's look at uh, what Anushwari writes uh, <clears throat> about this. The ICHR now acknowledged that an inquiry had been initiated in 1995. The heads of the publications division, the heads of the grants in aid section and the medieval unit had been asked what had happened to the manuscript. The grants in aid section had confirmed that the manuscript had been received. The publication section said the manuscript had never been forwarded to it. Okay. Bureaucracy. This is just the beginning, okay? Just the appetizer. Look at the main course. That left the section which was in a sense responsible for overseeing the project, the medieval unit. Okay. Medieval the, in many ways. Medieval unit is a official title of the department. <laughs> yes, medieval. Functioning. <laughs> medieval. The deputy director in charge of this unit said that the manuscript was not traceable in his unit. Not satisfied with the reply, the then director had once again urged the deputy director of medieval unit to do his best efforts to trace out the manuscript. But the friends, all entangled in those interlocking webs of mutual complicity, intervened and the inquiry was killed. Okay, so uh, two things for... Uh... It's still not over. Don't okay. jump the gun. <laughs> Guess who obtained a PhD from Rajasthan University in 1992 by submitting an annotated English translation of Arif Kandhari's Tariq e Akbari? Guess who has published the book in his name? The very same deputy director in charge of ICHR's medieval unit, Tasneem Ahmed. Terrible. So it was. It still does not end here. The issue having been pursued, the chairman of the ICHR launched a massive search for the Sharan manuscript. And guess what? The appropriator had thought that he had executed the perfect crime, that he had destroyed the manuscript of original manuscript of Dr. Sharan. But the thorough search initiated by the current chairman of the ICHR yielded 62 pages of the original manuscript in another file with corrections in the late Dr. Sharan's own handwriting. And wonder of wonders, that manuscript written 20 years earlier was for all practical purposes an exact verbatim prelude to the book published by Tasneem Ahmed mm -hmm. as his own. Okay, the climax of the story comes now. This Tasni Muhammad, who has published a completely plagiarized work of a, of Dr. Sharan and passes it off as his own. Guess who writes the foreword, a glowing foreword to the book? Ramila Thapur. Dr. Irfan Habib. This is where the story ends. Now, for your questions. Okay, so uh, <laughs> you, you, you chose to, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, that he was a uh, erudite scholar, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sharon. Sharon. So, uh, was he a Marxist or was he not a Marxist? Just for uh, no, he was not a Marxist. So he was generally brought in for his historical abilities, for his competence in the subject. Scholar, yeah. Okay. And this is what he was subjected to. Yeah. His work was subjected yes. to. His work was subjected. Okay. You know, this is the perfect example of preying on the dead body. Sick. This happened after Doctor Sharon died. So his demise. And this is, mind you, Parag, this is just one example which came to light. Yeah, clearly, I mean, the incest can go to any level. See how this happens and, you know, I mean, the shamelessness is unparalleled. This plagiarist par excellence, Tasni Muhammad, he obviously praises Dr. Irfan Habib for his, for his growing forward. And then he also praises another person. I'll read out his own words. Tasneem Ahmed's own words. My debt to my revered teacher, Professor Satish Chandra, is incalculable. He took great pains in reading and correcting the work and his considered suggestions have paid me rich dividend. <laughs> Bhagar has plagiarized the entire manuscript and, and he's, he's added to Satish Chandra. Satish Chandra. Okay. And... Uh, 
Not only that, let me read out Shauri's uh, own words. The plagiarized book is appropriately dedicated to the memory of my revered Ustad, Professor, Professor S. Nurul Hassan. Mm -hmm. I hope the son-in-law got a chance to say a nice hello to Tasneem Ahmed. <laughs> I don't know. That does not uh, uh, figure in this uh, book. So The entire manuscript was plagiarized. The entire book is plagiarized. And printed and published under Tasneem's name. Shocking. This is just a sample of the kind of rot. But, you know, as we go on in the subsequent episodes, we'll have a chance, at, uh, uh, chance to look at the other kind of crimes that these people have uh, committed in the name of writing history and, you know, objective, rational, scientific history of India, guided by Marxist theory. And as we draw, in every episode, as we get, uh, I mean, we get further, hmm. it gets more and more disturbing, Sandeep. So, just give me a second to regain my composure. composure yeah. <laughs> No, I, I, I still think there is, um, there is a dire need to, you know, call these people to the account. We should. They need. It. And now we can come on to the, you know, move to the next uh, section of this episode, which is the actual distortions of Indian history that the Marxists have committed. So we'll get into the, uh, you know, specific details, along with the name of the alleged historian rather a Marxist ideologue, along with the kind of uh, some of the major distortions that they have committed. We'll do that in the next episode. But as a teaser, as a segue into uh, the next episode, let's look at uh, uh, another um, beautiful uh, incident. Around uh, 1990 or 91, 92, that period, 92, I think, Manoj Raghuvanshi, you must remember his name, he was a journalist. He used to conduct a, a program on uh, ZTV which had just launched. It was called Aapki Adalat, Aapka Faisla. Not the Rajat Sharma one, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. one conducted by him. He had uh, invited uh, K.M. Srimali, eminent historian, and Arun Shauri to a talk show that he was hosting. And... Uh, Raghuvamshi, in that program, Raghuvamshi read out a news report that Outlook had published. Okay. Magazine. Mm -hmm. Outlook mag magazine published. So the news report was that the West Bengal Board of Secondary Education, the government had issued instructions in 1989 that read as follows. I read out the instructions verbatim. Muslim rule should never attract any criticism. Destruction of temples by Muslim rulers and invaders should not be mentioned. So this is an official circular issue? Official circular. By the state government? There's still more on the way. So in that program, Raghu Vamshi, he asks Srimali a pointed question. Isn't this circular historical distortion? A call to commit historical distortion. So, Shri Mali's response, I mean, these people also come prepared with, you know, their tricks of their trade. So, his response, you know, uh, Raghuvan Chiji, Manoj Ji, I, did, I don't even know that such an instruction has ever been issued, sir. <laughs> well, well. And if it has been issued, I am definitely against it. But, 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 the but is where the answer lies. But, one must see what the context was in which the instruction had been issued. Standard line. And then, at that time, honest school teachers, you know, headmasters, scholars of history in West Bengal, they sent full, full copies of the circular that was given to them by the West Bengal state government. Jyoti Basu was the CM back then. And the circular was dated 28 April 1989. And it is in Bengali. And uh, this is what it says. 
all the West Bengal government recognized secondary school headmasters are being informed that in the history textbooks recommended by this board for class 9, the following amendments to the chapter on the medieval period have been decided after due discussions and review by experts. The authors and publishers of class 9 history textbooks are being requested to incorporate the amendments if books published by them have these ashuddho, ashuddho Ashuddho. meaning impurity or errors, okay, in all the subsequent editions and paste a corrigendum in books which have already been published. A copy of the book with the corrigendum should be deposited with the syllabus office at number 74, Rafi Ahmad Kidwai Road, Calcutta, 16. Okay, signed by the secretary. And this circular was uh, attached with several pages containing two columns. One is the Ashuddho column and the Shuddho column. column. So, let me read out the Shuddho, the Ashuddho and the Shuddho text. Some of it. Just to serve as an appetizer for the next episode. The title of the book is Bharat Katha. It is. Uh, it was prepared by the Bardwan Education Society. Okay, page number one forty. Ashuddho text. This is what it reads. In Sindhu Desh, the Arabs did not describe Hindus as kafir. They had banned cow slaughter. This is the Ashuddho version. Okay. What is the Ashuddho version? Delete. They had banned cow slaughter. Yeah. Page one forty one. Ashuddho. Using force to destroy Hindu temples was also an expression of ag- aggression. Further, forcibly marrying Hindu women and converting them to Islam before marriage was another way to propagate the fundamentalism of the ulema. This is Ashuddho. Ashuddho. What is Shuddho? The board directs that the entire matter from using force to destroy, in that sentence, to Ulema be deleted, meaning that the whole, whole thing is deleted. Again, page 141. Ashuddho, the logical, philosophical, materialist, uh, materialist Mutazilla disappeared. On the one hand, the fundamentalist thinking based on the Quran and the Hadith. This is the text. What is the Shuddho text? Delete. On the one hand, the fundamentalist thinking based on the Quran and the Hadith. Another book, this is Bengali of course, Bharata Varshir Itihash, page 89, Ashuddho version, Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni used force for widespread murder, loot, destruction and conversion. Shuddho version, there was widespread loot and destruction by Mahmud. Let me make it passive voice, okay? Hmm. Delete the rest of it. There is no reference to killing, no reference to forcible conversions. Again on same page 89, Ashuddho. Mahmud looted valuables worth 2 crore dirham from the Somnath temple and used the shivling as a step leading up to the masjid in Ghazni. Shuddho. Delete and used the shivling as a step leading up to the masjid in Ghazni. Page 112. Hindu-Muslim rela- Ashuddho. Hindu-Muslim relations of the medieval ages constitute a very sensitive issue. The non-believers had to embrace Islam or death. Shuddha version. All matters, uh, all matter on pages 112 to 113 should be deleted. So this goes on. Uh, several this is like purging, twisting, cleansing. Com- everything, whitewashing, so, everything. And uh, the most extensive Shuddha, you know, deletions. Shuddha, Shuddha. The most prolific and most extensive uh, portions to be deleted relate, unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly relates to the regime of Aurangzeb. Not even that, there used to be a chapter in these books before the circular came out, there used to be a separate chapter called Aurangzeb's policy on religion or Aurangzeb, yeah. Aurangzeb. Oh, he had a policy. <laughs> yeah, he had a policy. Which so, is believe, believe uh-huh. or no. So, this whole chapter was knocked off. Ashuddho. Impure, incorrect. Okay. So, Arun Shauri dedicates one entire chapter to this Shuddho and Ashuddho. So, on that note, in the, you know, next episode, 
we will get into specifics of history distortion done by each of these uh, some of the major uh, eminent historians yes, yes. so this is just to like i said just to give a sample and the scale the extent and 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 the sheer brazenness of this whole distortionist enterprise is really mind boggling and it has unsurprisingly produced uh, terrible consequences you see all those uh, students who took part who uh, who lent their support during the uh, ca caa anti caa riots they are all the products of this kind of history writing and more currently what you happened know, at azim premji university yeah yeah, I, yeah I mean, annihilate annihilate the, the, yeah absolutely yeah. so sami uh, uh, a question that comes to my mind is appeasement has now reached a disease form in west bengal compared to most other states is there everywhere uh, and this this whole uh, circular is to do the same state and way back then under jyoti bosu's regime mm. so any particular reason why bengal went out of this way to purge every every negative attribution towards the islamic invaders simple Be mm. bengal had a communist government okay so the onus was on them same thing happened in kerala kerala okay okay and who were jyoti basu's friends all the all all the same gang members no romila thapar correct uh, his own tribe actually his own tribe understood, understood. this fellow acquired political power hmm. why will he not implement his implement, uh, yeah exactly exactly for the the cause and so. he will definitely hire you know his own comrades in crime all these fellows ichr type fellows while it might sound repetitive again this episode ends on a disturbing note with sandeep Uh, the circular that uh, Sandeep read out, issued by the West Bengal government, uh, uh, to any sane listener would uh, find it equally disturbing. So uh, I think uh, what Sandeep uh, did uh, was bring a lot of unknown facts to light uh, to the listeners, uh, and has set the stage for getting into again what has been a long, uh, uh, I wouldn't say pending, but a series of asks that we've seen from listeners on. the actual distortions done by some of the eminent historians which we'll talk about in the next episode and in this episode we covered the techniques used by marxists to capture each institute infiltrate the academia and eventually capture every medium including purging government libraries of relevant textbooks and putting it to their own and of course the subterfuge and the financial crimes that uh, sandeep read out as is uh, uh, from the great work that arun shori did uh, way back then Uh, I think it was very informative and illuminating, but again disturbing. So, with that, uh, we shall come back for the next episode of the Dharma Conversations, uh, where we shall take it forward, Sandeep, and talk about discussions in granular detail. So, thank you all for joining us uh, and uh, listening to Sandeep uh, share his insights uh, with each passing episode. Uh, again, like I mentioned. we hope this series serves as a bulwark or antidote to all the perversion of history that has happened over the years so it becomes a ready reckoner for all those listening and you can share it with those uh, you believe should know this so please like share and subscribe to dharma podcast and we shall continue this endeavor with sandeep as we go along thank you again for joining